Ah, so people, no beer just yet because although already noon, I'm thinking it's slow. It's a slow morning at that. Uh, I slept more than usual because uh, I stayed up later than usual last night. Which brings me to the subject of today's video, which is astrophotography with vintage lenses. fine welcome to this video and uh, although I will talk a little about the actual capturing of the Milky Way this video is more focused on the post-processing side of things now before we go into the meat and potatoes of this video let me just ask you to kindly consider supporting me if you find anything worthwhile here if you like this content here if you find it funny or helpful or why not both please consider supporting me. There's a handful of ways you can do this. Click subscribe, click the bell icon. Probably the most helpful regarding the YouTube algorithm is to stay and watch till the end because that adds up to watch hours and absolutely obliterate that like button. Furthermore, please also consider finding the buy me a coffee link down below in the description. Uh, there's a few membership tiers there offering various perks. Uh, there's a way you can make a small donation so please consider supporting me before we talk about the post-processing side of things let me just uh, briefly mention a few things you need to consider before actually processing anything because you have to take some images uh, in astrophotography images are called data or uh, frames um, but uh, you have to know there's four types of uh, data or uh, frames usually taken when doing astrophotography there's the light frames which are the actual uh, images of the night sky or the landscape or uh, your subject there's the dark frames also known as noise frames and these are at the very same settings as the light frames the only difference being that you put your cap on the lens so as to collect dark as the name implies frames where uh, you only have the noise that's helpful because uh, the post-processing software uses this set of frames to subtract the noise and uh, do impressive noise reduction to your uh, light frames there's also bias frames and flat fields or flat frames uh, which i will not be using today because i find them rather unnecessary for the type of photography i do they're usually more uh, uh, efficient when doing deep sky stacking of uh, deep sky objects so uh, just very briefly, bias frames are uh, very short exposures of uh, the noise resulting from the electrical currents of your sensors. And um, flat fields are used to compensate for vignettes or uh, any imperfection or dust spots uh, present in your lens. Today, we will only be using light frames and dark frames. You, of course, need a camera and a tripod. This is absolutely non-negotiable. You can't take steady shots handheld. The way you set your camera is uh, usually done according to the, well, some say 500 rule, but I usually use the 300 rule. What's that, you say? It's when you take 500, or more precisely 300 and divided by the focal length of your lens. Please keep in mind to 
further divided by the crop factor of your camera if you are using an APS-C or Micro Four Thirds camera. I'm using a full frame camera. Last night I was shooting with a 24 millimeter. I took 300, divided it by 24, and that should give me the longest exposure I can make and still keep pinpoint sharps. Otherwise, going any longer than that, uh, stars become elongated. You start having trails. So 300 divided by 24 is roughly 12.5, if I'm not mistaken. Rounding it down, I used 10 seconds and got pretty sharp stars. So a 10 second exposure. Then you have to set your aperture. While I was using an f2.8 lens, um, I didn't shoot at f2.8 because no lens performs best at its widest aperture. So I stopped it down, I think it was down to f4, and f4 and onwards correct uh, a lot of the aberrations and distortions uh, a lens shows at its widest aperture. So we have now 10 second long exposures at f4, and then you have to adjust the ISO. Keep in mind that uh, all cameras perform differently, so you have to know the way yours performs and adjust your ISO accordingly. Now I was uh, confidently using 6400 for uh, my Sony a7R. Some newer and better cameras can shoot up to 10,000 ISO without an issue, so know your camera and decide for yourself what's your best ISO. Please keep in mind, these settings are not a rule. Uh, these settings uh, I mentioned just for you to understand my workflow, because uh, it's not a hard and fast rule. Your mileage may vary. So how do you focus on the sky? How do you focus on the stars? I mentioned this because uh, it's not always the case that setting your lens at infinity focus gets you the sharpest stars. And let me just mention that you don't ever use autofocus. You always use manual focus. So hopefully your camera has a focus magnifying feature and you use that. So you point the camera at the brightest star you can find and use focus magnify to, well, focus magnify on that star. And then adjust your focus manually until that star is the smallest point it can be. When that star is the smallest point it can be, it's usually in focus. Then you have to frame your shot. This is entirely subjective, but uh, find a framing that works for you. Find a nice composition, frame your camera, and prepare to start shooting. What I do is use a built-in um, app on my camera to shoot a series of shots. Uh, some cameras have uh, built-in intervalometers, uh, I had to install a third-party app, but uh, you can also use a uh, hardware, either wired or wireless intervalometer, but uh, the results should be the same. You have to take a series of shots for you to be able to stack them later. I would say at least 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 frames for your light frames. Uh, Yesterday I took 50 frames and uh, it's kind of um, the maximum number of frames I would do because uh, any more than that there's just too much movement because uh, the earth rotates and there's too much apparent movement uh, of the Milky Way and the uh, processing software usually starts um, showing errors when there's too much movement. So choose a number of frames and have your camera start capturing. Then, either before or after that, you have to, well, it's not mandatory, but I usually take uh, one or more frames for my foreground. Uh, this is optional, but uh, I find it works better. After I've taken, or before I've taken, a series of shots for the sky, I take a very much longer exposure for the ground. Uh, I don't have to follow the 300 rule anymore because I will be compositing the 
frames later and you will see what I mean. But you have to lower down your ISO in order to get a cleaner image. Take a few shots of the foreground, shots you will be compositing later in post. Uh, you can try light painting uh, certain subjects you might have uh, or just use a single very long like three, 30 second exposure so then you can merge an image of the foreground and uh, the result of the stack of the sky images. So now that you've taken 10 or 20 or however many light frames, pictures of the sky, you have to take a few dark frames and you do that by leaving your camera just the way it is and it's important to do it very soon before or very soon after, preferably after, because the result and efficiency of the dark frames is entirely dependent on factors like ambient temperature, camera body and sensor temperature. So you want to ideally finish taking a set of light frames, then you have to cover your lens with a lens cap or anything and capture, let's say 10 or 20 or 25, but usually no more than that. It sometimes makes a lot of difference. It, it helps a lot with uh, getting a cleaner, noiseless image. Now, before we turn around to the computer and start editing, let me just ask you again to consider supporting my work here. Although I am doing this entirely out of passion and because I enjoy it, I do appreciate it if you find it worthwhile to subscribe, to like, to comment, and perhaps why not consider making a small donation or even joining the memberships I offer. Just uh, find the buy me a coffee link down below in the description. And with that said, let's start editing. So here we are at the computer and we are going to edit these here photos. I've taken uh, 50 light frames and 25 dark frames. I've also taken uh, this one, which is, if my plan A fails, going to be uh, my foreground. I'm going to take this here part and uh, composite it over the result of the stack but uh, I'm going to try to use these frames as well. I've uh, light painted the foreground a little using a regular flashlight. And uh, I would like for this to succeed because it, I think it adds a little more interest. Uh, the color temperature is a little off, but uh, um, I can easily fix that. I should go ahead and say that uh, you want to shove these photos in Sequator, the program we're going to use, completely unedited. You ideally want to load the RAWs directly, as I'm going to do, but uh, if for some reason you cannot, uh, I strongly suggest you load TIFFs at least, but I have to emphasize, do not edit your frames before stacking. This can lead to errors, this can um, throw off the stacking and alignment algorithms, so it's best to just uh, throw the unedited RAWs at uh, the program and process it and edit it after the fact. So let's jump into Sequator. And uh, the workflow is really very simple. You just go from top to bottom. You go through each of these steps and uh, do the appropriate uh, settings and basically you just uh, eventually click start. So double click here, load up your images. In my case, they're under MNT. Photo raw, oh, not here, raw 2021 August 6th Astro. And I know I have to, but let me just check to be sure. I have to skip the first four, is it? No, the first five. So it's 1430 all the way down to 1479. So 1430 is the first one to 1479, which is the last one. Correct? 
Let's check it's correct. It's correct. Once you open it, Sequator will choose a picture right in the smack in the middle for uh, the base image. Now, the base image is uh, the one image according to which Sequator will stack and align all others. So, you want to make sure that your base image, in our case is 1454, let's see 1454, you want to make sure that the base image has the framing you want, because as I said, it will stack all others according to that. So that will be your base frame. So yeah, this is going to be our base frame. This is where we load our noise images, and the noise images are these 25 starting from 1480 down to the last. Again, double click, navigate to where it is, rather where they are, plural. So what was it, 1480? All the way down to the left. Let's see, there should be, oh, there's 20, 50 light frames and 20 dark frames. Uh, you can get away with five light frames, the equator calls them star images. You can get away with five, with 10, with 15, I've done it with three, but uh, I've just taken 50 in order for uh, the sequator to have a lot of information to play with. This is where you would load flat fields, but we don't have any, so we're going to skip. So, a short explanation of what is going to be going on here. Sequator is going to make a map of the noise out of these images, because let's open one up and see this noise. A lot of stuck pixels, a lot of noise. So, Sequator will stack all these dark frames, generate a master dark frame and map the noise from it and subtracted from the result of the stack. So one more step down here is to choose an output for our resulting image. I'm going to go here into the working directory. Oh man, come on, click and create a new folder, call it result, enter it, and give it a name. We'll name it, uh, let's see, Milky Way Stack Result. Result. Yeah, that's it. Be sure to export an uncompressed TIFF, never a JPEG. Save and always be on Align Stars. When stacking um, images, landscape images, including a foreground, always be on Align Stars accumulation. Be sure to click Freeze Ground because otherwise uh, the whole ground will be blurry. Move down to Sky Region and uh, check out this red dot. It means it requires attention. Whenever a dot here turns blue or green or yellow, anything else than red, it means you can uh, proceed. Now this is where you paint over the sky, telling the program which part of the image is the sky. Use the scroll wheel to adjust the size of the brush. Use the left click to paint. Use the right click to delete. Now you do not have to be incredibly precise with it but you do have to pay attention not to select any of the ground as sky so what i do is not this what i usually do is go a little over the ground make a smaller brush and then with the right click just delete what needs not be sky it's very okay if you leave a little bit of a gap here but be careful not to have any ground selected as sky this is basically enough 
Now this is where you choose your preferred settings. Uh, this is done uh, on a case by case scenario, but uh, I usually find that it's better if I click and choose high dynamic range and leave auto brightness off. What auto brightness does is, uh, well, brightens up the resulting image a lot, but we will be doing that in post later on. To remove dynamic noises like satellites or uh, planes or stuff like that, you double click here and choose on. Be careful to select auto and complex to reduce distortion effects. By that is meant all these aberrations happening in the corner, usually always the case when shooting really wide lenses. And it's the case here because this was shot on a 24 millimeter. Moving on, you have the option to reduce light pollution. Sequator will use a filter to reduce what it knows to be the hue of light pollution. Well, sometimes very helpful. I will not be doing this now because this is pretty dark skies. This is a border two area. So, uh, and also according to my previous tests, Reducing light pollution for this particular frame does more bad than good. We will choose to enhance starlight. This is uh, what is also called pixel binning. It, uh, and if you want to know what all these do, you have to just click it and read the description here. Pixel binning is uh, taking four pixels and merging them into one, uh, allowing for more data, more information. However, reducing the image to a quarter of its original size. So I will not be using this. This is not going to be necessary now because uh, it stacks every five or so frames and exports images for a time lapse. The color space is sRGB, so this is basically it. Now we will click start and it will take a while. In order for you to better understand this process, you can read the description here. It will mention everything. It first loads, as I mentioned already, the noise images creates a master noise image, a stack of the noise image. Then it subtracts it from the light frames because this can take up to, well, depending on the number of images to stack anywhere from uh, 10 seconds to hours and also depending on the processing power of your computer. I will use the magic of editing and fast forward this i'll catch you when the entire process is done so here we are almost 34 minutes later sequator completed successfully and it will now load the image at first glance you're tempted to say what the shit, man i mean uh, it's a really dark image even appears to be looking worse than any of the 50 light frames, but fret not. There is a lot of information here. We just have to open it and process it further. So now that we have our stack result, we want to take these five images, put them into the queue and export them as TIFFs be careful to choose TIFF and uncompressed TIFF at that. Choose a folder for them. I chose this folder in our working directory and we're just going to export them as they are. Um, we're going to use them in GIMP. So now that raw therapy finished converting them into TIFFs, let's just do this open all as layers. Go into result and take this one then do open as layers 
with the tiffs and these tiffs will be used for our foreground now um, first and foremost we want to go ahead and do some preliminary editing to our stack result because as a parent this is really really nothing to look at but once we pull out levels adjustment checking both here and here we can see we need to stretch the histogram and pulling the white point all the way down to here you can see already there is a lot more information for us to work with um, for now it's enough let's do some curves now and before anything else let me just select the green channel and pull it down a little because I find the Milky Way to be a little too green this is a much more natural color this uh, copper sort of orange color is a lot more natural yeah after this pulling the curves adjustment again going for a subtle ass curve just to give us a little more contrast you can see and perhaps doing it once more this should be good for now um, what I want to do next is prepare our mask uh, we will take care of this very bright glow here eventually but for now I want to duplicate this to prepare our mask we will use a mask in order to keep the sky from the stack result and use these images for our foreground let's just remain rename this into mask and because it will be our mask we don't care about doing this horrific thing to it I'm just um, maxing out the saturation because uh, it's very helpful when I desaturate the image so there's really almost pure black here really useful for our mask Moving along further, choosing levels and uh, bringing the white point down, essentially increasing the contrast, turning this part really white, bringing this a little higher, ensures for a pretty much pure black here um, this is the point where we go to edit choose copy visible we have copied this in order to paste it into a mask we no longer need this so we can either uh, disable it or just simply delete it Click this icon to create a white mask and now paste it it will be pasted as a floating selection and we need to click this anchor layer in order to get a mask already we see its effects but uh, we need to refine the mask and to do this we are going to take a brush really smaller brush at that not that small 100% uh, hardness 100% opacity and really fill in 
and uh, cover these white specks because uh, we need a really good mask here. Now you can and be my guest to use any of the masks available here or either in Photoshop, but uh, this level of precision is really, really hard to get with any 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 other methods. So uh, now we just have to switch our brushes from black to white and paint this bigger brush, paint this uh, upper part here with white. And soon enough we will have our brush. When we reach this lower part we will be lowering hardness a lot because we want a natural faded brush like this. I think we can try to do this this way. That's a little overboard. Just a little more, just a little more. Hit OK. Now fill in this part here manually. The really smaller brush. This is where this kind of brush is really helpful because it's speckled and really irregular like that. So it makes for, it's a good, uh, substitute it looks like trees so now that we have our mask let's use it and here we are we are using the sky from the stack result and this here let me just hide these so it's easily apparent look Look at the precision of the mask. You really, you really can get this kind of precision using this manually. So now, deactivating our uh, stack result, let's just work on the foreground a little. Go to shadow and highlights and raise the shadows a little. I think this is enough. Let's see how it looks. It's uh, okay-ish, but uh, we will make use of these frames in order to uh, add a little more interest. And uh, this is really going to be the base and use this in uh, lighten only mode activate here go to curves and choose the green channel and take it down because uh, the color balance is really off now look at it it's really really fitting the image adding a little contrast It's looking good. Maybe pulling the opacity a little lower. And basically the same with these other layers. Just choose light and only, colors, curves, tone down the green channel. give it a little boost in brightness because it's a little too dark 
okay another curves adjustment to add a little contrast this is looking good activate this one go to lighten only this is what it's doing and this part giving shadow to the far to the farther parts of the image curves green channel tone it down tone it down some more value and some contrast no actually we're going to raise the shadows in the farther parts let's see what this is doing this is not doing really a lot so uh, I think I'm not going to use this layer so let's uh, activate this other layer choose lighten only go to colors curves Choose the green channel and tone it down a little. More, a little, more. Now go to value and uh, try and lift the shadows a little. A little too much. And uh, it's uh, already looking pretty good. Just check out the before and after this is uh with just the uh, long exposure frames and these are light painted frames i composited in uh, perhaps this uh, needs to be toned down a little further it was a dark night after all and uh we are reaching a point where i'm kind of satisfied with this image we still have to fix this really glowy part here and uh, this is about where i hide this layer merge visible layers all the layers into a single foreground layer and we'll even call it for ground I'm going to duplicate this and use this as a dodge and burn layer really bring down the exposure and uh, apply this mask because we need to create another mask and paint in with uh, where are the tool options with a really soft brush opacity at 100 softness or rather hardness at zero really low force and just uh, try to darken, darken it down, darken up these parts here. I think this is pretty good we will merge it down and further merge it down again we no longer need these two as separate layers go further and uh, try and lower the highlights a little before doing 
uh, general curves. So this is uh, about where I am starting to be kind of happy with it. I think I should try doing the opposite, duplicating this layer, going for uh, more exposure, masking it, and uh, trying to lighten up the corners. I think this is pretty okay already. Some sharpening, I think, would uh, do okay. But of course, not on the mask. Let's merge this down and uh, go for some sharpening. Not this much, of course. Still a little bit too much. Still a little bit too much. This is pretty much where I am going to call it done. Um, I think I'm just going to give it a little noise because I find the foreground layer to be a tad too clean, just a little too clean for my tastes and uh, other than that I think perhaps trying to get rid of this green hue here but uh, I can almost call it quits. I can almost say I'm happy with it. Let's just go a step back before the noise and try to give the sky a more natural color. For that we want to take a bit of the green out and give it some more blue. Hmm? Yeah. This is starting to look really, really nice. Because uh, the sky needs to be blue, the Milky Way needs to be this really copper color. And uh, yeah, I think this is okay. Let's just do one more thing and try and get rid of this uh, glow here by uh, reducing the highlights a fair amount. And before exporting, let's just give it some noise. And this is about where I call it a day. Uh, I think I'm just going to crop it a little because I don't really like this part here. And uh, it will just uh, help to get rid of the aberrations and distortions in the corner. And uh, other than that, uh, yeah, 
I like how this looks. It's a really nice image. It's pretty much done. Where is the crop tool? Fixed to aspect ratio. Let's just uh, think something like this something like this should work let's look at it yeah it's a pretty good image <sighs> good old coffee this has been pretty much it uh, it's probably a longer video than I expected but uh, there's a lot to go through and uh, this process is uh, kind of complex. Hopefully I've been uh, helpful. Hopefully I was uh, clear enough for you to follow along perhaps and understand all the concepts I mentioned here. If you found it useful, consider hitting the like button. No, actually destroy that like button. Please do. Absolutely destroy it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't, click the bell to be kept uh, up to date with um, future uploads. Consider supporting me following the buy me a coffee link. So until next time, this has been Radu. Be well everybody, bye bye.